Chapter 31. Ignoring the rest of the weights for now, he walked over to the training dummy. It exuded a strange light to his vision and he scanned it. Training automaton. Jirank magical item. A robot made for the purpose of training with. It can be set to multiple different modes within the parameters of an average G-rank strength. Sam raised his eyebrow. This was not an ordinary dummy. Apparently he could use it to fight with. Now that he saw where it was situated, it was abundantly clear to him how it worked. It was in the middle of an area cleared of weights and there was a button on the ground that was labeled force field. He pressed it and a blue field shot up around the area. It looked the same as the one that had been used in the arena to prevent attacks from reaching the audience. He slammed his fist into it to test how strong it was. The wall did not budge. Then he hit the button again to make sure that it would turn off the field. He stepped on the button and the force field retracted. Now satisfied that the whole thing was safe, he inspected the robot. There were five buttons on the front of the robot, each marked with a number range. The first one said 1 to 15, and the other ones had more intervals between 15 and 50. If this thing was supposed to simulate the power of a G-rank combatant, then that told Sam that the top of G-rank was level 50. For just that alone, the robot was valuable because he had not been able to find out more about the ranks than what he had read in the system guide. Sam pressed the lowest button and stood back as the robot whirred into life. It stepped back into a fighting stance and came at Sam with its fists. He blinked. It was incredibly slow. Steeping under its guard, he uppercut the robot with his fist, slamming it into the ceiling. It came down and did not rise. The robot had crumpled, its metal bent around where he had punched. As he watched it knit back together and stood to attention, completely still. Sam pressed the next button, this one said 15 to 25, and he waited. The robot woke up faster and it came at him at a far higher speed than before. He caught its fist, stopping it in its tracks. Even if it was faster than him, he was still stronger. Then something happened that he had not expected. A ball of fire shot out of its free hand, catching him in the face. Cursing, he recoiled, letting the robot break free. Another punch came in, rocking him on his heels. With a roar of rage, he punched back, this time imbuing his fist with some Dao energy. He was not sure what doing so did exactly, but it seemed to be quite effective. A faint white glow formed around his fist and it shot forwards like a bullet. The robot crossed its forearms to block, but it was shot backwards by the force. The robot struggled to its feet, but Sam was already upon it. His left fist fainted and as the robot responded, he drilled in the chin with his right. With a crunch, the robot's head crumpled and it fell to the ground. Breathing heavily, Sam contemplated the fight. The robot had become far stronger in just a single jump from the first level. If it really simulated a fighter, then the next one would be the first one with a class. Sam wondered if he should be content with just the second level, but then he gathered his resolve and decided to go for it. This was an invaluable opportunity to train himself in relative safety. He doubted that the robot would kill him, and sure enough, he found out that there was a safe word coded into it. If he said stop, then it would stop. Taking a deep breath, he drew his mace, and pressed the next button. The robot sprang forward immediately, with no warning. Sam dodged to the side, but was still caught with a vicious clothesline, slamming him into the hard ground. The air rushed out of him and he bounced back up, blocking the next stroke with his mace. The robot looked different now, and it had fist wraps on this time. Its eyes glowed brighter than before and Sam even felt a faint pressure from it. It was as if the robot possessed a Dao. He could tell that it was not a real Dao however, just something made to simulate one. Sam pushed back with his dual Daos, succeeding in knocking the robot off balance. It let out a dull robotic roar and flashed forwards towards him. That was not its natural speed thankfully, but the use of a skill. Sam rolled to the side and he slammed his mace into the side of the robot, leaving a small dent. The robot wheeled round and launched into a devastating series of blows, all moving at the limit of Sam's perception. It was far more skilled than him in the martial world and he only knew how to swing his mace. For the first time since he had gained the system, Sam's intelligence stat began to work over time. The intelligence stat was strange in that it did not actually increase conventional intelligence, only things that were actually useful in a battle. It would not allow a fighter to suddenly begin to solve complex mathematical equations if they could not do so already, but it would let them read their opponents for openings. As the fist of the robot came crashing down on Sam, he suddenly saw how to avoid it. With an artful twirl, he used his mace to knock away the hand and retaliate with his free hand. His fist slammed home and the robot stumbled away. He looked down at his hand in amazement, not sure of what had just happened. Sam almost lost his head to a karate chop, but he snapped out of his amazement, just in time to avoid it. Using his hand again, he caught the robot, throwing it over his shoulder in a modified judo throw. 
That was impressive, because he had never done judo in his life. Turning his body, he slammed his mace down on the robot, but it rebounded off a shield of blue light. This robot was geared up to the max. It placed both hands together, and they began to glow with a fiery light. The fist wrapping burst into flames and the robot surged upwards, uppercutting Sam. The bottom of his face was seared for a brief moment, and then he was piledrived into the roof of the shield. His vision failing, Sam fell to the ground. As the fist of the robot came in, his Tao exploded out of him, the force of anger causing his skin to ignite with red light. Sam growled at the robot and shot his hand out, grabbing onto its neck. Roaring in exertion, he began to squeeze. As he did so, a burning pain gripped his body in its embrace and his skin began to peel. The robot began to melt beneath his hand and it started smoking. Sam closed his fist, breaking his fingers with his sudden, savage strength. The robot fell to the ground and Sam fell with it. As he woke up, he saw that the robot had returned to its previous positions. His skin was red, as if he had been in the sun for too long. Small wounds were in the process of closing over, his regeneration at work. Checking his system interface, he saw that he had a new notification. You have gained the Dao skill, fiery rage, epic. The power of rage fills your body, it's toxic fire able to send your enemies to death. Such power comes with a price however, and your body is that price. Channel your Dao into yourself, boosting your strength and speed, but dealing constant damage to yourself as a result. Sam looked at the robot with newfound respect. He had thought that it was just some toy, but it was actually invaluable. The robot had just helped him develop another Dao skill, now bringing his total to two. This thing was the true reward for the tournaments in his eyes, one that he had earned with his strength. He wished that he was able to buy one of these for himself, but he had not seen any for sale in the markets. In addition, they would probably cost more than he had on him even with the money from Jeffrey. Also, he had noticed that his skill name format had been altered, which was probably a result of his updated stat sheet. Now that he had streamlined his stats, it seemed that his notifications were made somewhat clearer as well. He was too battered now to go for another round, and he was ready to enjoy the amenities. Chapter 32 First up was the hot tub. As he neared it, his body started to relax, in a manner that suggested more than just normal heat. Peeling off his clothes, he lowered himself into it, and sighed in relief. It was not a normal hot tub. His skin began to regenerate at a visible rate, and his mind was calmed. With the last presence of mind that he had left, he scanned the hot tub. Calurin Peon Level Hot Tub. Jirank Magical Item. The cheapest item sold by the sector-renowned Calurin Spa Company, this hot tub is enchanted to provide relief from minor aches and pains. Even a mere Peon Level product from this company is equivalent to a higher quality one from a lesser company. This product is copyrighted by the Calurin Company. Any attempts to copy this product for personal gain will result in censure. He briefly read it, but he could not bring himself to fully study it. Instead, he sank back into blissful nothingness. The water cooled after a few hours and he drifted back to awareness. His entire body was refreshed and he felt as if he had slept for an entire day. The description of the item came back to him as he got out and dried off. He had never seen a company name in an item description before and it made him curious about the larger multiverse. In addition, the description of the hot tub as a peon level 1 was strange. He had thought that the only description of an item's quality was its power rank. Apparently there was a whole system of corporate quality guidelines as well. If he ever got the chance to look into it, he would. The more important part of the hot tub was that it had healed him of his wounds. Now he was fresh and ready for the first round of the tournament. Sam had to wait another few hours for the tournament to start, time that he spent working out with the weights. It was deeply satisfying to use inhumanly heavy weights and he never tired of seeing the massive balls of metal rise up into the air as he curled the dumbbells. He was in the middle of resting, his hair slicked back with sweat, when a voice rang out through the room. Fighters. The first round will begin in 15 minutes. Please make your way to the arena staging area. Sam had no idea where the arena staging area was, but his token lit up and he felt the same tugging sensation that had led him to his room. Following it, he traipsed through the halls, finding himself in front of a crowd of people. Next to them, a large door stood, revealing the inside of the arena. He could hear faint cheers from outside and as he looked in, he gulped. Every person on earth was sitting there. Normally, he was not that shy but at the sight of over four million people, he quailed. A few others were having panic attacks in the corner and Sam watched as they were carted away by an alien attendant. Barigis stood in front of the door, his pink skin flushed with excitement. Greetings. The tournament proper is about to start and all I need to tell you are a few rules. Firstly, killing is not banned, however if your opponent surrenders, then killing them will result in disqualification. 
Secondly, surrendering does not count unless the words are spoken fully, in a way that the other fighter can hear it. Finally, the use of anything except for a single weapon, or set of weapons, and your own skills are not allowed. Any outside assistance or illegal goods will result in disqualification. Now, for the format of the fights. All the fighters will be seated depending on their strength prior to the tournament. This way, someone who is near the bottom of the rankings will not be facing off against one of the top 10, at least initially. If you lose a match, then you are placed in the loser's bracket. Three wins there means that you will be placed back into the tournament. Now, it's time for the first fight. Will Rika Harold and Tobias Lurch please step forwards? Two of the people in the crowd stepped forwards, a small woman with dull red hair and a skinny man who had a permanent scowl on his face. They walked up to Barigis who whispered in their ears. Both of them nodded and they walked up the ramp and into the arena. Chairs rose out of the ground beneath the remaining fighters and they sat down. Two large screens appeared at the front of the room, showing a panoramic view of the arena. One screen focused on Rika and the other one focused on Tobias. They both stood still, and then Barigis vanished from in front of Sam. The alien appeared in the middle of the arena, rising up on a pillar of rock that erupted from the ground. He pulled out a microphone, an unnecessary implement given his level, but it made the whole display somehow seem more natural. IT is time. The fights that you have been waiting for will now begin. Brought to you by the finest specimens of your planet, these will be the most engaging displays of raw power and honed skill that you will ever see. Make sure that you don't miss it, or else you're going to regret it. Now, let's have a big hand for our first fighters, Rika Harold and Tobias Lurch. The crowd erupted into applause and the two fighters shifted uncomfortably. Barigis leaped off the pillar and vanished again, a colorful explosion going off in the air where he had been. Both fighters ran forwards and the battle began. Sam could immediately tell that they were nowhere near his level. The two seemed to both have focused on dexterity, at least partially, as their movements were crisp and collected. Tobias started off the fight, with a beam of blue light from between his fingers. It sped through the air, but Rika drew a rapier from her belt, slicing the beam down the middle. Tobias' scowl deepened as the crowd cheered for her. She leapt forward and Tobias quickly summoned an energy shield in front of him. The woman raised her rapier up and brought the tip down with all of her strength. The blade sunk into the shield, sending a spiderweb of cracks through it. Then Tobias smiled. A bolt of lightning leapt from his fingers and into the tip of her rapier, causing her to spasm in shock. He sent off a bolt of kinetic force and propelled her off the shield. With a snap of his fingers, the shield dissipated. The man used some sort of rapid-fire mage build, with focus on speed rather than power. This was shown by how his opponent got to her feet after taking his attack. She grimaced and raised her sword, slashing it down through the air. A thin strip of white light came out, reminiscent of the attack used by the Angel of Death. This one was far weaker however. It still managed to connect with Tobias, cutting into his arm. The mage snarled at Rika and charged her, his fists glowing with arcane light. This quickly proved to be a mistake. The man was not a melee fighter and he was obviously outclassed by Rika. His fist came down, but she was already gone, with her rapier slashing down on his foot. Tobias tried to get out of the way, but it cut straight through his Achilles tendon, hobbling him. By then, the fight was over. The woman held her blade to his throat until the man yielded. With a flash of light, he was teleported away and Rika was left there to enjoy the adulation of the crowd. A door opened on the other side of the arena and she walked over, glad to be out of the spotlight. Chapter 33 The two screens in front of them changed colors, one of them now green and the other red. A scoreboard appeared with two different brackets on it. One of them was the loser's bracket, which Tobias was now in, and the other was the winner's bracket, which Rika was in. Rika walked to the back of the room and sat down at an empty seat. She was mobbed by other fighters, but she ignored them. It seemed as if the first fight had received VIP treatment as the other ones were announced by the scoreboard instead of Barigis himself. For the next three hours, Sam sat there watching the matches. Most of them ended rather quickly, one of the fighters much stronger than the other, but a few were quite interesting. The 35th fight was between the Bear of the Motherland, a man who Sam had briefly seen on the level's leaderboard, and another man who called himself Reaper. Reaper had a very unsettling skill set. He could commune with ghosts and use them for power, and he started off the fight with the summoning of a terrifying apparition. It looked like a giant diseased head that had blank white eyes, marred with cataracts. It let out a piercing scream that had most of the audience on the ground from how loud it was. Some of the stronger people resisted it and were able to catch the first few moments of the fight. A beam of gray energy shot out of the mouth of the specter and towards the other fighter. The bear, a tall and heavily muscled man, leaped over it, with his battle axe overhead. 
With a loud exclamation in Russian he fell down, with his axe glowing brightly. It crashed into the ghostly head with a thunder crack, struggling against the ectoplasm for a moment before cutting through. A loud cheer rose from the crowd, especially from a certain area. It seemed as if the man had a fan club. Reaper was unperturbed and he raised his hand, summoning a transparent sword into his hand. The man ran forwards and ducked under a wild swing of the bat leaks, chopping at the other fighter's leg. The bear narrowly dodged it and slammed his axe down, cutting off a piece of Reaper's lank black hair. The bear taunted him, but he failed to notice the wave of energy that formed behind him. By the time that he turned around, it was already too late and he was swallowed up by an amorphous ghost. Reaper turned around as if to say that he was done with the fight, but a roar echoed out of the ghost, coming from the bear. The ectoplasm started to tear and the ghost exploded into a cloud of jelly-like fragments, revealing the Russian fighter there. His skin was burnt away in places, but he stood tall and proud. Pointing his finger at Reaper, he spoke. That was a cheap shot. His thick Russian accent lent extra depth to his words. Reaper shrugged in response. All's fair in love and war, the man said, in a flat monotone. The bear scoffed and threw his axe forwards. As it flew, a jet of blue fire formed behind its head, propelling it at greater and greater speeds. Its owner ran behind it and with a howl of rage, he leapt up and grabbed his axe out of the air, using its momentum to add extra power to it. Reaper stared at the weapon as it fell and then thrust his hand out, a spike of gray energy forming on it. His opponent tried to dodge, but he was in the air so it was impossible. The skewer of energy pierced him through the stomach. Instead of falling back like Reaper had expected, the bear leaned forwards and grabbed onto the spike. His palm sizzled as it touched the ectoplasm, but he gritted his teeth and pulled himself forwards. His axe came down on top of Reaper, the man unable to get out of the way. The axe sunk deep into the man's shoulder, lodging in the bone. The bear smiled in triumph as Reaper fell over, but then he too fell backwards, the blood lost too much for him. The fight had ended in a tie and the scoreboard reflected that. Both of the fighters were sent to the loser's bracket and would have the chance to redeem themselves later. Most of the fights were quite dull to Sam's eyes, as he saw them in what was basically slow motion, but a few like the one between the bear and reaper were interesting. As well as being just entertaining, they told him a bit about the fighting styles of those who he would probably end up fighting eventually. The 131st match was the first one since the beginning that Barigis announced to the crowd. Now, for the greatest match yet in this tournament, the prodigy of the Tao vs. the Slayer of Demons, we have the Arbiter vs. the Angel of Death. Sam was finally up. Excited for the fight, he stood up from this chair and locked eyes with his opponent across the room. They walked up the ramp together and faced off on the sand. Barigis hyped up the fight and the crowd's cheers rose to unprecedented levels. When the signal to start rang out, Sam studied his opponent closely. He did not know much about the man, except for a bit of his fighting style. If he underestimated his opponent, then he would very well lose. Despite his own twin Daos, the other man had a higher level than him and past level 25, levels really increased one's strength. The Angel of Death was silent as he in turn studied Sam and they waited a good few seconds before engaging in battle. Sam waited for the other man to strike first, as he was slower than the Angel. His sword flashed out of its scabbard in an arc of steel and light and pointed towards Sam. He raised his mace to defend and the first attack came in like a lightning bolt. Two streams of white light erupted from each slash of the man's sword and sliced through the air at Sam. He held his mace in defense, but the force behind the attack still staggered him. They were far stronger than he had expected them to be judging by their effectiveness in the first battle. Perhaps the man had been holding back his true power in order to trick the other competitors into making rash decisions. In any case, Sam was still in the fight and he pushed aside the light beams with his mace, relying on his prodigious strength to do so. The other man stared at him and then flashed forward, his rapier point outstretched. Sam planted his mace in the ground and began to draw upon his Tao. The fiery feeling of pure rage filled his body. He only had a few seconds before the damage would become debilitating, so he channeled his wrath to its fullest extent. His skin glowed red and his hand accelerated to far higher speeds than he normally would have been able to reach, grasping for the rapier. The angel was faster still however, and he twisted in midair to avoid the reaching hand. Sam tried to dodge, but he was far too slow and a stripe of pain slashed across his cheek, drawing blood. He roared and redoubled his Tao use, succeeding in catching the angel with his hand. With a growl of rage, he twisted and slammed the man down into the dirt, cracking something in him. The angel had focused almost solely on speed over all else, and Sam was going to make him regret that decision. Obviously pained, the man jumped back up after Sam had let go, limping slightly. He screamed something out in Italian and then exploded into pure white fire. 
The fire condensed around his form and fiery wings formed behind his back. Sam briefly wondered how the man had been able to get past the system translator but decided that that question was useless in the current situation. Instead, he braced for impact. There was no point in dodging the next attack as it would far outstrip Sam's speed. Instead, he would have to tank it. Crossing his arms, Sam attempted to give himself a modicum of protection. He funneled some of his Arbiter Dao energy into his arms, hoping that it would increase his defense. Chapter 34 His opponent raised his rapier and screamed the name of his attack. Lightning of the Exorcist A bolt of light sprang out of the tip of his rapier and rose up into the air, forming into a thundercloud about Sam. It glowed with an ominous purple color before discharging a flurry of bolts down on Sam. He screamed in pain as his skin melted beneath the assault, but he held it together until it was over. He must have looked like a mess to the audience, his skin in tatters and his body covered in blood. He was still kicking however, and the angel of death was about to learn what happened when you messed with someone who had two daos. Sam smiled at the other man, his lips burned away, and his opponent took a single step back. Sam closed his eyes and began to visualize his daos growing inside him. Two specks of light began to grow out of the darkness, one of roiling fire and the other of a pure white energy. They were extremely small, but they both contained infinite potential. Sam saw that both of them were tapped of energy, as a result of his usage during the fight. He still had enough in the tank to finish this however. With an eruption of sound and power, both of his fists burst into flame. One of the flames was a blinding incandescent light and the other one looked more like conventional fire. Both of them were equally deadly. His skin burned away even more under the fire, but he ignored the pain and focused on condensing the power down. The fires were crushed under the force of his will into gauntlets of light that coated his hands from the wrist down. He seized his mace and the fire began to course down its length, setting the weapon aflame. Sam growled as his skin peeled away, but he withstood it. With a grunt, he raised his mace over his head and brought it down on the ground in front of him. A thick wave of force swept across the arena, causing the remnants of his Tao energy to dissipate. Sam swayed, but did not fall. The angel of death scoffed and stepped to the side, but the wave followed him. The force of judgment combined with rage would not allow its target to escape that easily. The dexterous man danced around the attack, but for every second that he dodged it, it sped up. Sam almost fell over as his body was suffused with exhaustion, but he forced himself to stay upright. If he fell now, then the fight would be over and his opponent would have won. The crowd was deathly still as they watched and none of them even blinked, such was their desire to catch every minute of the fight. Sam slapped his face to stay awake and watched as the wave finally caught up to the angel of death. It crashed into him with the force of a meteor, cracking his bones and sending him across the arena and into the wall. To Sam's surprise, the man rose again, but then fell to the ground, utterly spent. Berigius appeared and he grabbed Sam's hand, raising it into the air. We have a victor. The rest of his words were drowned out by a tumultuous storm of cheering and clapping from the stands. Sam smiled weakly as he fell backwards and into the abyss of sleep. Sam woke up on a bed in a white room. The room was lined with other beds, each with a person on them. Sam recognized some of them, such as Reaper and the Bear of the Motherland. Next to him was the prone form of his opponent. Sam quickly turned the other way, ashamed of his brutal assault on the other man suddenly, but a crackly voice beckoned him to stay put. Don't be ashamed of your victory. It was a well-fought battle. You are clearly my better. I thought that my skill might be able to bridge the gap, but apparently the system does not lie. You truly deserve your position on the leaderboards. The angel of death's voice was soft and raspy, very different from how he had sounded during the fight. I can tell that you are a man of honor. I have decided to trust you with my name. I am Eduardo, hopefully that makes my name less of a mouthful in your mind. Sam chuckled. The other man had no idea just how true that last bit was. A lot of the fighters had used long pseudonyms, forcing Sam to either abbreviate them as he thought about them or just say it all out loud. He weighed the other man's words, wondering if he was being truthful with what he said. Sam eventually decided that he was. Thank you. My name is Sam, and I give you this in hope that you will not betray me. You seem to be a good man as well, and God knows that the world needs those right now. Eduardo chuckled. It's a difficult thing, being a man of God in the world of the system. Every day I wake up, wondering if my faith is truly placed. If the system is a God, then are we all creations of a machine? My goal is to find out the truth behind existence and see once and for all if there is a God. The arrival of the system has been both a curse and blessing for the devout. Sam gave that heavy statement the silence that it deserved, thinking on it himself. He had never been an especially religious man, but he still believed that there was something greater out there, something perhaps divine. Now he was only confused. Was the system truly a god, 
or was there something else out there, something that actually was the creator of existence? He had read about the creator kings in the system guide to the multiverse, but they were only the gods of this multiverse, not all of reality itself. Suddenly, a burning desire blossomed in his mind to uncover the truth as well. He was an eternity away from gaining the power to find such a truth, but he resolved himself to never give up. He turned towards Eduardo again, but the man had fallen asleep. Sam smiled weakly and lay back down, letting himself rest and recuperate. A steady drip of some red fluid pumped into his arm from an I.V bag and he could feel a strange warmth emanating from where it was inserted. He focused on that warmth to distract himself from the pain that he was in. He had overtaxed his daos and now he was paying the price. With the last vestiges of awareness left in him, he used his eyes of judgment on the man sleeping next to him, smiling when he saw the pure white light that limbed his form. He had placed his trust well. Then he slept a dark dreamless sleep, punctuated by flashes of brilliant light that intruded upon his slumber. Sam awoke back in his room, fully healed from his wounds. Everything was as he had left it, the robot still in its circle and the gentle bubbling of the hot tub in the background. He stretched his muscles, testing to see if there was any residual trauma. There was none. The medicine of the multiverse truly was miraculous. He lay back on his couch for a few moments, recovering his mental fortitude. Even though he was healed, the effects of the pain were still with him and he needed a break. Then he mustered his resolve and got up. That fight could have gone either way and he realized that he was nowhere near as strong as he thought he was. The people above him on the leaderboard would probably be able to effortlessly deal with him, and he would probably have to face them sooner rather than later. It was time to avail of the training resources that he had been given. Firstly, he warmed up with some weightlifting. His muscles were tired from inactivity in the hospital bed and he needed to get them working properly again. His goal was to beat the fourth setting of the training robot. He had no hopes of doing so, but he knew that his opponents were at that level. The overlord was already within the level range of the robot and he had a Dao as well. If Sam's plan worked out and he made it to the finals, then he would likely be up against the strongest man on earth himself. It was a daunting task, but one that he was ready to undertake. With a deep breath, he stepped into the circle with the robot, turning on the force field with his foot. Then he pressed the fourth button. Before Sam knew what had happened, he was on his ass, with a fist planted on his neck. The robot glared down at him with its bright eyes and prepared to cave in his head with its other fist. Sam struggled futilely and then turned off the robot. Stop! The training robot froze in place and then withdrew its arms, letting Sam get up. He had not been physically hurt, but his ego had been severely bruised. That robot had been so fast and strong that he had not even seen its first move come in. Sam was far behind the level's curve of earth, but there was no way for him to level up in this environment. He would have to make up for it with his Dao. Chapter 35 He was still on the top of the Dao leaderboard and he would likely stay there, if his status as the Dao incarnation of existence was anything to go by. Sam was frustrated by the obtuse name of his status. It didn't tell him anything more than that he was better than others at forming Daos. The name sounded like something special, but in reality it barely increased his strength. It was like in those anime where the villain would give their final attack some ridiculously overblown name, but in reality it was just a quick sword strike. What had confused him was why the system had seemingly hidden it from him. It had come up previously as the mark of Tantalo's Veravax, something that Jeffrey had told him did not exist. Why would the system go to such lengths to conceal that from Sam? It wasn't like he posed any sort of threat to it, he was sure that the system could kill him in an instant if it really wanted to. Sam sighed and sat down. Lifting weights wasn't doing anything for him, the only way to get stronger now was to increase the power of his Dao. So far, he was more inclined to increase the power of his Dao mode of the Arbiter first. He had no wish to become some raging brute, unable to do anything but think with his fists. Sam closed his eyes and found his Daos again. This time, he studied them intently. In the background, there was a faint light and he sent his consciousness towards it. To his surprise, he saw his core. The light coming off it was brighter than it had been before, but it was still quite dim. He turned back to his Daos and saw that they were orbiting his core like tiny planets. This told him that they were connected to his cultivation in some way, which was accurate, he supposed, as both paths to power relied on vast amounts of time spent grinding. His level increased as he killed opponents and his Daos increased through contemplation. He flew back through his core space towards his Daos and stopped in front of his Dao of the Arbiter. The mode of light spun quickly, with the backdrop of total darkness behind it. Sam approached, but he started to feel a pressure pushing him back. As he neared, he felt more and more pain from the pressure. He gritted his teeth and touched the orb with his hand. A jolt of incandescent agony swept through his body and he was transported off to another time and place. 
He stood in the middle of a battlefield and watched as two forces clashed with each other. Both of them were wearing the same armor and bearing the same flags. Their war shook the ground and all around them, cities and towns were shook to their foundations, killing millions of people. Still they fought and Sam was briefly shown why they fought. One of the leaders sought justice for the deaths of his children, allegedly slain by the leader of the opposing army. In reality, it was a manufactured scenario, set up by the true enemy to make them fight each other. This battle would split the world apart if it did not end soon and Sam watched with bated breath as earthquakes and tsunamis ravaged the world. The power of the people in these visions were always far more than his own, to the point of absurdity. As a fissure opened up, leading to the planet's core, a man glowing with power appeared in the sky. Raising his hands, he called down a rain of energy beams, wiping out the warring armies to a man. He shed tears like rain as he did so, and Sam was informed that he was the king of this world, and the father of the two leaders of the armies. The man looked straight into Sam's eyes as the vision faded away and Sam was sent back to the environs of his room. There was some deep meaning in the vision and Sam found it after a round of meditation. The vision had shown him that sometimes, justice was more important than anything else. It had greatly pained the king to kill his own children, but it was necessary for the survival of the planet. Sometimes, Sam would have to make hard choices in order to preserve justice. You have deepened your connection to the Tao mode of the Arbiter. The maintenance of justice is not an easy task. Sometimes, your mind and spirit will rebel against the tasks that are necessary to preserve order. You have realized this truth and as such have increased your understanding of your Tao. Sam felt like he was in greater concert with his Tao now, and he felt that he was beginning to understand its ideals. An arbiter was an impassive instrument of justice, one that had to preserve their path over all else. If Sam wished to be an arbiter then he would have to follow this path to the letter. It would be a hard path, but also a rewarding one. It would take him to the top of the multiverse if he followed it all the way through, as if he was to judge all of the unworthy, then he would need to be stronger than them. Sam felt dizzy as he took in these parts of his Tao and he walked over to the hot tub to clear his head. Sinking into the warm waters, he felt his mind unwind and unravel. His body was in peak condition so all he felt otherwise were the soothing jets of water. If it even was water. Sam felt that there was something strange about the liquid in the tub. It was slightly more viscous than normal water and it became more viscous the more injured one was. The first time he had been in the tub, it had felt almost like honey. Now, it was like a light syrup. He only realized this now that his mind was a bit clearer than before. Either way, it was refreshing. He only hoped that he was not bathing in the mucus of some sort of high-level monster. That would not have surprised him at this point. He let himself have a long soak in the tub and then he left it, ready to return to training. Sam wondered why he had not been called back to the arena. Perhaps he was being given a short break from the fighting. After another hour of lounging around and working out, his token began to pulse again. He followed it back to the arena entrance and found his seat. All around him, people whispered and pointed at him. Sam was glad for his mask, but he wished that he could find a more comfortable one. It was starting to get tattered as it was only a piece of clothing after all. Across the room, Eduardo gave him a thumbs up. The man had also recovered from his fight and he made it clear to Sam that there were no hard feelings. The two men who had entered the tournament together, Rodney Kane and the Scourge of New York, sat together, staring daggers at Sam. He had no idea why they were so antagonistic towards him, perhaps they were afraid that he would surpass them. Neither of them had a doubt so they clung to their number two and three positions with a very tenuous grasp. For all the acrimonious interactions that he had had with the men, he was glad that he would have a chance to put them in their place. He had used his Tao skill on them before and both of them were as black as pitch from their sin. His Tao of the Arbiter cried out for justice and he would enact it soon enough. Strangely enough, the system had not considered the attack that he had used against Eduardo in the last match as enough of a focused discipline to be considered a skill. He had not received any notifications about it, which was just as well because it had severely injured him. Maybe the system only codified a skill after the user had gained some degree of proficiency with it. The match that was going on at that moment was just a low level one between some sort of beast tamer and an archer. Neither were that skilled and Sam checked the leaderboards, confirming that neither had a class. The number of people with classes was still extremely low and there was no opportunity for anyone to grow stronger here. As if to disprove his thought, Barigis stepped out of the shadows and into the room after the match ended. That marks the end of the first rounds of the tournament. Some of you languish in the loser's bracket, waiting for your chance for redemption, and the rest sit triumphantly in the winner's bracket. Now, it has come to my attention that many of you find the fact that there are no leveling opportunities here to be unfair. Well, I have decided to create a solution. We will have an extra event within this tournament. 
The crowd looked at him with confused expressions. He paused and then snapped his fingers. Oh, right. The event will be a monster hunt. You all will be placed into teams that will have to defeat a series of progressively stronger monsters. I have arranged for some very special specimens to be imported, so this should be fun. Barigis pointed up at the boards and a countdown appeared. You will all have 12 hours to prepare in any way that you see fit. You can visit the city outside the arena for this if you wish, but make sure that you finish up quickly because you will be teleported here when the time has passed, no matter what you are doing. I suggest that you use your time well. The pink alien disappeared, this time eliciting no reaction from anyone. Chapter 36 They were all used to the man's strange powers by now. Sam had theorized that the man was about E-rank from what Jeffrey had told him about the powers of the multiverse, but he was completely wrong. On the D-rank planet Karenna, three universes away, in the middle of the universal core, Barigis let out a deep breath. He was situated in his office on the highest floor of the crowning jewel of the city world of Karenna, the headquarters of his media empire. It was named after the first of his wives, who he had been with for millennia. As a cultivator should, he possessed a vast harem of wives, but of those only the first was the one who he truly loved. She had smiled upon seeing an entire planet dedicated to her name. Creating a solar system-sized planet out of high-grade materials had cost quite a bit of credits, but it was money well spent in Barigis' mind. In addition, it gave him a place to relax when he was feeling stressed. Visiting such a pauper's den of a universe such as the newly initialized one was mentally taxing, and he needed a good dose of opulence and splendor to recover. His physical body was also drained as well. The use of his astral imprint was quite taxing on him, even though he was a peak D-rank cultivator. The only reason that he had done so was because of the money that he would gain from personally attending the tournaments of the newly initialized universe. Someone high up in the multiversal totem pole had paid him a fortune in C-rank monster cores to keep an eye on the Arbiter, aka Sam Atlas. He had initially refused, such a task as babysitting a peon from some new universe was beneath him but when he heard that the man was not only the first person in his universe to form a Tao, but that he had also done so faster than anyone in this sector before, he had become intrigued. It was not every day that the head of the largest news network in the nearest ten universes was surprised, but this was one of those occasions. Upon meeting the man through his astral imprint, Burgess had been astounded by the clarity of his spirit and Tao for one so young. He had heard of the geniuses that initialized universes sometimes created, but he had never witnessed one for himself until now. Growing up in a wealthy universe that had been inducted into the system billions of years ago did wonders for one's personal safety and peace of mind, but it also led to most of its inhabitants stagnating in their cultivation. He had also sensed the presence of a few other prodigies, an old man, a causal anomaly who had adapted to the system far more easily than any other inhabitant of his planet, and a strange creature who was not entirely human. How such a creature made its way onto the planet was unknown to him, but he was sure that quite a few sects would be interested in him. Barigis hadn't bothered to visit the other parts of that universe, but he had felt a few rising stars among the other species. Compared to the blazing beacon of Earth, they were but candles however. Something had happened on that planet, something that allowed its cultivators to grow at an unprecedented rate. If Barigis was able to capitalize on that efficiently, then he would have a slightly higher chance of breaking into C rank. He had been at the bottleneck for millennia, and he could find no way to break through. Expensive pills, monster cores, even seeking out natural expressions of the Tao such as the last moments of stars did nothing. This was perhaps his last chance for glory, for the chance to become a universal king. He would not waste it. It was a pity that the universe was already claimed by the butcher, but Barigis was wise enough not to go anywhere near that madman. This meant that he would not be able to recruit anyone from that universe, but that was fine with him. He could find a way, just as he had built his company from a small leaflet business on an unnamed moon near the fringes of the universe. Leaning back in his starfire tiger skin couch, he closed his eyes and sank into a trance, envisioning the future with his Tao. The visions that he gleaned were always muddy, but sometimes they had meaning to them. Recently, the image of Sam Atlas had blazed within them like a dying star, outshining everything else. He would turn the boy to his cause, or he would die. It was as simple as that. The Tournament City Unaware of the universal level intrigue that he had created simply by existing, Sam roamed the streets of the unnamed city that the arena stood in. He had tried to find out where it was, but had so far been unlucky in that regard. There were no natural landmarks or any sort of way out of the city. It seemed to stretch on forever, far beyond what a normal city would be able to reach. He had given up after an hour, and went off in search of that delicious food stand that he had visited on the first day. It had taken a while as the city was built like a maze but he eventually made his way to it.to his surprise, 
there was a line in front of it. Upon seeing him, everyone made way, but he had no wish to profit off of the other's fear. No, I'm fine. I'll wait in line like everyone else, Sam said, as much from the uncomfortable twinge in this Tao of the Arbiter when he had toyed with the notion of skipping, than out of common decency. His Daos were beginning to root themselves strongly in his body and soul, and he knew that he would have to follow them faithfully or risk unforeseen consequences. After the line of about fifty people had finished buying their food, Sam bought his own meal and walked around the city as he ate it. It was just as mouthwateringly delightful as he had remembered as he polished it off in a matter of seconds. Now he had to get to the more important business, which was replacing his mask. He roamed the streets for a good while, looking for a shop that sold masks. Most of them were mobbed with people looking for cheap knickknacks or weapons, but he eventually found one that was almost empty. There was only one person in it, an older man, at least judging from his white hair. Sam did not bother to speak to him, as he seemed busy, but instead made his way to the back of the shop where a rack of clothing stood. There, on the top, was what he was looking for. An ivory mask that would completely cover his face. Sam picked it up and prepared to pay for it, but a crash came from over where the older man stood. He had tripped over a rack of goods and was lying on the floor, bleeding heavily. Are you all right? Sam asked as he rushed over. He tore off a piece of his clothes and wiped at the blood on the man's leg. Then he paused in confusion. It was not blood, but cherry juice. He looked into the twinkling eyes of the man, and saw his face for the first time. It was profound visionary. The man smiled at him mischievously and got up. You are an honorable man. There was no need for you to stop to help a strange old man who had fallen, but you did so nonetheless. None of the other people that I had tested acted in that way. Some of them pretended to care, but they did not, in their heart of hearts, have any time for me. But you were different. Curious. Sam paused for a minute and then answered. What can I say? It was the right thing to do. Just because we are all superhumans now, does not mean that common decency should be a thing of the past. If those other people treated you like that, then they were wrong to do so. However, why did you test them in that way in the first place? Sam added at the end with a narrowing of his eyes. Oh ho, we have a sharp one here. That befits your Tao well indeed. Imagine my surprise when I met the man who had managed to form a Tao before me. I had thought that you were a fraud, but now, I can tell the truth. You really did surpass me in the following of the way. Even though I have spent my entire life in search of the universal truths of the Tao, you still managed to beat me to it when we gained the ability to truly connect to them. Only time will tell how you choose to use that power however. The door of the shop opened suddenly and Sam looked over. It had just been a gust of wind. He turned back towards profound visionary, but the man was gone. Shaking his head, Sam picked up the mask and walked out of the store, his clothes conspicuously missing a piece of fabric. So confused by his strange encounter he was, that he did not even notice. Chapter 37 The remaining time until the tournament continued was spent wandering the town aimlessly. Now that Sam felt secure in his disguise, he decided that it was time to check out the competition. He searched for the other top ten people, but did not find any. They had all disappeared off to somewhere that was inaccessible to him and presumably everyone else too. As he walked, he ran through the various alliances that he had noted among his competitors. It was quite clear that the number two and three men were working together, but he had no knowledge of some of the other top rankers. The overlord was still an enigma as far as he was concerned. He had heard his voice, but that was it. He had never encountered some of the others such as Phoenix and Melissa Tang, and had only briefly seen Anonymous. As the tournament progressed, he would likely have to fight them. This next event would be what made or broke his chances. He needed to level up badly, as he was still stuck at the very bottom of the class levels. When he was teleported into the arena, it was a relief, and the sight of Barigis was oddly comforting. Welcome to the Grand Monster Hunt. You will all be divided into teams of ten, and depending on factors such as your position in the arena and overall strength, you will either go first or last. On the scoreboard, a few hundred lists of names appeared. Sam was recognizable by most, so his teammates came over to him immediately. Seven of them were just random competitors, but the other two were people that he knew, either personally or from seeing them fight. The first one was Reaper, the man who had channeled the power of the grave against the bear of the motherland. The other one was Eduardo, the man who Sam had fought against recently. As soon as they grouped together, their name appeared on the board. There was no opportunity to create a team name and it was simply called the Arbiter's Team and they were near the top of the list. Sam's presence as well as that of Eduardo and Reaper, who was at number 15 on the leaderboards, had nudged them up to the number 3 place. The team above them was called Rodney's Team, led by Rodney Kane. With him was the Scourge of New York and Anonymous. Finally, the top team was led by the Overlord, 
who on his own had sent his team to the top place. Everyone else in his team cowered in fear of him and he seemed to enjoy the effect that he was having on them. As the final team grouped together, Barigis spoke. Now that you are in your teams, I shall tell you the rules. The 100 weakest teams will enter the arena first, then followed by the next 100 and so on. The arena has been modified with spatial magic in order to make it fit all of you and the monsters. The event theme is Dark Forest and the arena will be set up to match. The winner of the event, the team who has killed the greatest number of monsters and with the highest average slain monster level, will each be given a special reward. In addition, you will also be able to level up normally within this event. Inter-team sabotage or assault is discouraged, but not banned. However, unless you are entirely sure of your strength, it would be best to abstain. Let us begin. The gates of the arena opened with a clang, Sam had not seen the gates before so it must have been a theatrical addition, and the 100 weakest teams were ushered out. Muffled howls came from the arena, and the interior was pitch black. After a minute, the first human scream wafted out. Sam winced, but remained stalwart. Several of the competitors tried to run, but they were not allowed to. Tut tut. Did you not read the small print on the contract that you signed? Oh wait, it was in subatomic script, none of you are able to read that. I apologize for writing in such a style, but you must understand that I am used to dealing with far more powerful individuals. In any case, this should not be a cause for fear, but rather a gift. Sam paled as he realized the implications of that statement. There could have been anything on that piece of paper, anything at all, and he would never know. What if he had promised the next decade of his life away to Barigis? Sam calmed himself and forced his mental state to flatten. None of that mattered right now. All that there was to worry about was the next event. The next hundred people entered the arena, some of them visibly resisting the pull of the contract. One of them lingered for too long, and a surge of electricity danced across their skin, killing them instantly. Barigis laughed in glee. When you are all more powerful, remember this lesson well. Never sign a contract of any sort, unless you are sure that it is not trapped. That fool there suffered the consequences, and I hope that you all are wise enough not to follow her. Sam began to feel his twin Daos pulse within him, demanding justice for the death, but he restrained them. If he tried to attack Barigis then he would die. Instead, he banked up his Dao energies, resolving to one day enact justice. It sickened him that the seemingly genial man was in reality a stone-cold murderer, but he supposed that in the multiverse, power was everything. Nobody would care about what happened to a few frontier citizens, especially if they were only G-rank. It was indeed a valuable lesson, but beyond just the scope of what Barigis had said. It further inflamed Sam's desire to grow strong enough to rise above all of this, and to be able to protect himself and those who could not protect themselves. Finally, it was their turn to enter the arena. He felt a vague pressure begin to form around him, but he quickened his pace and the feeling vanished. They entered the arena, and were immediately plunged into darkness. It was like the essence of night had been summoned into the arena. All around, the shadowy outlines of dark trees could be seen. One of Sam's teammates whimpered softly as he looked around him. Far above them, the beating of vast leathery wings could be heard, hinting at the presence of some leviathan hiding in the clouds. On the ground, all was still. The eerie silence of the shadow-limbed woods ate away at Sam's resolve in a way that was definitely not natural. He began to output a steady stream of Tao energy, succeeding in repressing the effect of the woods. All around him, his teammates sighed in relief. Eduardo turned to Sam and whispered softly in his ear. Was that your Tao? Yes. Why do you ask? Sam replied, a bit apprehensively. He trusted the man somewhat, but anyone could be a traitor, especially in this new and twisted world. That must mean that this wood is suffused with Tao energy. I felt this ominous pressure until you used your Tao to beat it back. This is not a natural wood. It might not only be the monsters that we have to worry about, Eduardo cautioned, his tone stern. Sam nodded in agreement and told the rest of the team what he had just been told. Watch out for any suspicious occurrences in the woods. They might not just be a backdrop for this event. The others nodded, but Reaper glared at Sam. Why do we have to follow you anyway? The man said, addressing the whole group. What gives you the right to lead us? Eduardo began to angrily rebut the man, but Sam raised his hand. Please, let me defend myself. Look, Reaper, I was chosen to lead this team because I am the strongest among us. If it was not for me, you all would still be under the effects of the forest. If you think that you can lead us more efficiently, then prove to me that your power is sufficient to protect everyone here. Sam crossed his arms and waited for the brash man to answer. Reaper scoffed angrily, but wisely did not attempt to press the point. Chapter 38 Sam kept an eye on the man from then on, making sure that he was not planning anything. 
As he studied him, he realized that Reaper could not be more than 16 or 17 years old. He hid his face well, but he had the telltale wispy mustache and beard of a boy of that age. Sam chuckled. He could guess why he had gained the power set that he had. He had probably been some sort of edgelord or weep before the system came and he naturally gravitated towards death. Sam did not know how he accessed those powers without a Dao, but that was a question for later. For now, his Daos were enough and he did not need to go chasing alternate routes to power. Besides, it was very unlikely that he would tell Sam anyway. They made their way through the tree softly, watching out for any monsters. The first one appeared about ten minutes into the journey. It targeted the weakest of the fighters, a mage who specialized in the manipulation of air. The monster looked like a twisted version of an elf, with long ears and a grotesquely elongated body. It was about ten feet tall and it had to hunch over to walk under the branches. The woman screamed as it approached her, and she desperately cast a spell, but the monster dodged it and lashed out with razor-sharp talons. Sam rushed forwards to protect her, but Eduardo got there first, his rapier outstretched. The exorcist weaved around the flashing talons of the monster and opened up a series of deep wounds on its side. The monster, realizing that it was outclassed, tried to run away, but Reaper finished it off with a bolt of ectoplasmic energy. Sam fell back and nodded in approval of the teamwork. He scanned the corpse and found out that it was a mutated troll, and that it had been level 17. The levels of the monsters in this arena were far higher than most of the humans here and Sam gnashed his teeth as he thought about the evil of Barigis. How had the man transitioned from seeming so nice, perhaps a little eccentric, into this Machiavellian mastermind? Perhaps it was the effects of a drastically raised intelligence score as well as a history in deception. They cautiously edged around the woods and encountered many more of the trolls, but nothing else. In the beginning, they came one by one and were easily dealt with by Sam, Eduardo and Reaper, but the quantity and quality of the trolls began to tick up over time. Sam screamed in rage as the first of his teammates died to a troll that he was unable to kill in time. His entire body began to burn up as the untrammeled effects of his Tao of anger showed, and the darkness around him briefly retreated, revealing a sunlit forest floor. A pillar of red energy shot up into the sky from Sam's body and he exploded into action. There were six more trolls in the woods around them, but they all met a quick and bloody end within a matter of seconds. Sam did not bother to even use his mace, instead tearing at them with his nails and in one case his teeth. The trolls crumpled under his blows and he was left panting and snarling at a tree, which he punched as the last vestiges of his rage left him. With a resounding crack, the tree split in half and fell over. He walked back over to his shocked companions and refused to say a word to them about it. His Tao was beginning to become somewhat concerning. It had a strong grasp over his mental state, and even though he could somewhat contain it, it had an undeniable allure to it. Why shouldn't he unleash his rage upon those who wronged him? His other Tao had no quarrel with it, and as a barometer of virtue, it should tell him something about the morality of using his anger to benefit himself in battle. Perhaps he was just being naive about a new tool in his arsenal, but it still felt wrong in some way. Luckily, he had no reason to use it again for the next few hours as they trekked along the forest floor and hopefully towards greater leveling opportunities. All of the lower-leveled members of the team had leveled up by now and the lowest level one had gained two levels from the fights. After the first death, Eduardo had decided to add everyone except for Sam to his party. The man had no trouble with revealing his name to the others, but Sam did not want to have his name exposed. Doing this allowed the weaker people to gain essence from the exploits of the strong. Sam was beginning to grow tired of the endless monotony of the forest and when the first new enemy arrived, he felt a surge of elation. It was shaped like a pixie, a small winged creature with humanoid proportions. Unlike most pixies, it had sharp fangs and demonic facial features, with curled horns rising from above its brow. It hissed at them as it arrived and clapped its palms together. A massive ball of fire roared into life above its head, but it was not normal fire. Instead of glowing with a flickering orange light, it was a dark brown color, and exuded an aura of cold rather than heat. The pixie threw it at them with a maniacal chuckle and they scattered out of the way. Where it landed, the entire area was turned into a frozen mass of churned earth and weeds. It cackled again and prepared to launch another fireball, but Eduardo stabbed it through the throat, cutting off its spellcasting and its life. What the creature possessed with its spellcasting, it lacked in durability and it only took a single hit to kill it. The demonic pixie gave enough essence to take the three lowest leveled members up by another level. Now, the average level of the party was standing at around 17, the level of the weaker monsters. It surprised Sam just how weak most humans were compared to him and the rest of the top rankers. Most of the group was on edge by this point and Sam had to maintain appearance to prevent them from bolting. 
Despite how much the forest and its creepy atmosphere bothered him, he had to keep it together for them. He was sure that the oppressive atmosphere was a deliberate effect of the trail, and not an incidental one. All right. I have an idea, Sam said. Reaper and Angel, go to the other side of our group. We should move in a circle rather than in a straight line. Nobody questioned his judgment. It made sense all of the immediately. If the strongest members of the party were on the edges of the group, then they could watch out for monsters far more easily than if they were all at the front or back. Using this strategy, they made it safely through the next segment of the arena, the one with the pixies. After they had adjusted to fighting an enemy that used ranged attacks, they found them an easier prey than the trolls. Firstly, they were nowhere near as fast as the trolls, despite their ability to fly and they were so weak that once one was in range, they could easily kill them. Chapter 39 By the time that Sam leveled up for the first time, it felt like they had been in the dungeon for the better part of the day. As he leveled, the system told him just how many monsters he had slain over the day. It was a staggering total for a single member of a party to kill, and the fact sunk into him that he might very well die here, stuck forever in this endless maze of trees and darkness. You have killed a juvenile mutated fell troll, x124. You have killed a darkwood pixie peon, x113. You have leveled up. For the first time, Sam saw a new descriptor of a monster's strength. It seemed that for normal monsters, the system used the names juvenile and mature to describe their power, but now it used something different for the pixies. He remembered that word being used in the scan of the hot tub back in his room and the idea that the pixies might be just as sapient as them surfaced. He had heard them chattering in the shadows, and had thought that it was just normal monster noise, but what if it was words that were too high-pitched for him to hear? Was he now a mass murderer? At any rate, it didn't matter right now. The pixies were trying to kill them, so it was just self-defense. It wasn't like they had any choice in the matter. To distract himself, Sam pulled up his status sheet to allocate his points. Sam Atlas. Human. Mortal tier. G rank. Class, Dao Visionary. Level 26. 3 free stat points. Strength. 40. 1.325x. Constitution. 26. 1.325x. Resilience. 28. 1.325x. Dexterity. 17. 1.325x. Intelligence. 18. 1.325x. Wisdom. 23. 1.325x. Health 260-260. Mana 180-180. Stamina 400-400. Dao. Dao mode of the Arbiter. Dao mode of Anger. Skills. 1x Common, 1x Rare, 1x Epic, 1x Legendary. Titles. 1x Celestial. Temporary Titles. 1x Epic, 1x Legendary, 1x Mythical. Dao Heritage. Dao Incarnation of Existence. Party. Torturna Salvinii Brescan, Level 24. Health 310-310. Rax, Level 23. Health 320-320. Skill Branches. Muscle Density Enhancement, Level 1. Sam had gained his class stat points, but he had three unallocated. Wondering what would be the best choice in this situation, Sam decided to go for something different this time. He had focused on strength for quite a while now, and it was time to branch out a little. In these woods, reaction time was king. It was the difference between dying to a fireball or a slash from a troll's claws. With that in mind, Sam put every point that he had into dexterity. By this point, he barely felt the bodily changes brought on by adding stat points to a physical stat and all he sensed was a faint tingling in his muscles. Before he tested out his new power, he saw something new on his stat sheet. Since he had left them, Jeffrey and Rax had been leveling up, and at quite a good rate too. They were both almost at the level where one gained a class and Sam was glad for anything that would increase their power after the tournament. He planned on winning, or at least placing in the top three, which would allow him to create a faction. Sam needed to start cultivating alliances between himself and other influential humans in order to create a power structure after the tournament. He had already been approached by Okita, but he wasn't sure if the man was or would be still alive after this part of the tournament. He knew that he could leverage his reputation against people to gain favors, but that sort of behavior left a bad taste in his mouth and more importantly a twinge in his Tao. As Sam and his diminished band of fighters aimlessly wandered through the woods, the top two teams made their way towards the center of the arena, where the final boss was. Both of them had their own ways of finding the center, but one of the groups was closer than the others. As soon as they had gotten out of sight, the overlord had killed every member of his team and gone out solo. This made it so that he would move at his full speed and that he would get every last drop of essence that he could lay his hands on. 
The other group had been more peaceful in its establishment of a hierarchy, but not by much. Only two of the weak members of Rodney's team had survived and they had pledged undying service to the man. The Scourge of New York, contrary to his name, was not much of a fighter by himself, but was an invaluable support member of the team, and his level gave him an edge. He had access to a hidden web of microscopic satellites that had spread across the world upon the arrival of the system. Unlike anyone else so far on Earth, Andrew Monroe had been contacted by a faction from outside of the universe. He had been walking home from his office as the first of the monsters spawned and he had run in terror, tumbling off the side of the Brooklyn Bridge as he ran across it. As he entered the water, he had felt a massive tentacle close around him, and he had prepared for death, but rather than some kraken from the depths, come to kill humanity, it was an envoy of the prophets of the machine god. Over the next few days, they had altered Andrew in their image, creating a technological marvel of biological engineering, close enough to human that none would know how to tell the difference. This had warped his mind to the point of insanity, but he was very good at hiding it. His mind could work far more efficiently than any other humans and he could track down anyone on the planet if he had a fragment of some technology that they had gotten their hands on. His creators had implanted a string of code into him that made it impossible for him to betray them in any way, not that he wanted to anyway. If any of the multiversal factions found out that there was a servant of one of the most reviled powers in existence hiding out on Earth, the planet would be no more, the ambitions of Tantalos Veravax be damned. He had inveigled himself with the number two ranker on Earth and laid the foundations for the takeover of the universe by his faction. The Overlord on the other hand possessed a different type of power. It was a natural one, sanctioned by the system. He possessed the first stages of what would eventually blossom into a full bloodline, a genetic imprint stored within the system that it implanted into the bodies of promising cultivators. He had earned it through trials that no human should ever have had to endure, at one point being reduced to nothing more than a disembodied head. His bloodline was of a species of draconic wolf that was renowned for its keen senses, some of them beyond the physical. The overlord had gained the ability to see raw mana and this had directed him to the sites of many natural treasures across the earth. Accessing these had allowed for his levels to skyrocket, beyond anyone else. Now he used his talents to search for the greatest concentration of power within the arena, as that would lead him to his quarry. Upon sensing a blazing beacon of power dwelling in the center of the woods, he had dismissed the normal enemies as a red herring, which they were, and made his way straight for the prize. Chapter 40 Far up above the arena, Barigis watched the hunt unfold, sitting next to the replacement system imprint as he did so. Unlike an actual system overseer, the creature that had been placed in charge of the system within this universe was a weak creature, fallible and utterly mortal. It still possessed enough power to crush Barigis like an ant, but he had the thing on a tight leash of reciprocity and blackmail. It feared the day that the true system overseer would return, as its existence would be ended upon its arrival. Barigis had dangled the promise of a way out over the creature, as long as it helped him with his goals. Under the purview of the system, the little trick that he had played with the subatomic script on the contracts was completely illegal. However, the imprint had tweaked some of the rules and made it so that Barigis could make it work. Unfortunately it was only enough of a back door to bind the signers for a short amount of time, enough for the monster hunt and the tournament, but it was not enough to permanently force anyone to serve Barigis. It was only a stopgap measure to call most of the herd, and allow those who Barigis wanted to preserve to rise to the top. He watched the events unfold within the arena just as he had planned. Both of the most powerful teams had found the real prize in the event, and the team of Sam Atlas was still alive, which also suited his purposes. The system imprint was still confused by his scheming however. I don't understand. Why would you want your favored pawn not to reach the center? It asked him, pointing at the meandering path of Sam's team. Barigis laughed. It felt good to be smarter than the system for once in his life, even if it was not really the system. Did you not see how Sam lost himself to his rage earlier when only one of his companions died? Imagine what would happen if all of them were to be slain. He would go utterly berserk, his Tao rising in prominence until it threatened to eclipse his soul. He would break out of it, his will is strong enough, but by the end, he would have caused enough damage to break his other Tao. I have no interest in a servant who serves justice. But anger is another story. I can bend him to my will far more easily then. The system imprint nodded appreciatively at Barigis' artifice. I understand. How ingenious. Barigis smiled, but inwardly scoffed at the imprint. Of course you don't, you cretinous machine. How could you? I am the pinnacle of existence, the rightful hegemon of this multiverse, Barigis thought. Needless to say, humility was not one of his strong suits. Sam doubled over in exhaustion, his body spent from the exertion of the past hour. 
After they had passed into a part of the forest where the trees grew even closer together than before, everything had become far worse. The monster attack had doubled in intensity and a new, even more dangerous species of monster had arrived. It looked like some sort of sentient patch of resin, which would drop down from the branches at random. It was not merely sticky however, but it was composed of a highly potent acid that even burned Sam. To the weaker members of his party, it was a death sentence. Another of his charges had died, and one of them had lost an arm to one of the sap monsters. They professed their ability to remain useful in battle, but Sam feared that they were not long for life. If not from their wounds, the warrior would soon die to a monster. A seething volcano of apoplectic rage simmered in Sam, but he had nowhere to vent it. He needed to keep all of his focus on the protection of his companions, with no room for a temper tantrum. It felt like he was suffocating, he was so enraged. Both at himself and Berigis, but mostly towards the latter of the two. Sam and Eduardo had begun to feel a strange presence within the arena over the last thirty minutes, and they were making their way towards it now. It felt like the aura of a powerful monster, which they were sure was the boss of the event. If they killed that then their levels would skyrocket, or at least go up, and they would probably win the hunt. The only problem was that it seemed as if others had already detected the monster. Some of the branches in front of them were broken, betraying the path of another team. Sam would have bet his last level that it was one of the two strongest teams who had beat them to it. He cautiously pulled back one of the broken branches and inspected it. There was a fleck of greenish blood on it, which was definitely not human, or as far as he knew, of any of the monsters in the forest so far. His ears began to pick up a faint scratching noise coming from ahead, and he signaled for the others to tighten up their formation before they went ahead. Sam started to imbue his body with mana and the armor of his skill formed over his flesh. Behind the branches was a clearing, one that was filled with gremlins. These were no ordinary gremlins however, they were the size of people. Beady black eyes glared at Sam from under thick, deep-set brows and muscular appendages extended outwards from their chunky torsos. In the middle of the group what could only be described as a madman stood. He was caked in blood and filth and his eyes were unfocused. Slobber dripped down from his mouth and onto the floor. On his head was a rusty iron crown, one that looked like it had been picked out of a dumpster. He locked his eyes on Sam and hissed. Brothers! Attack the invader to our holy court! The man screamed, spittle flying out of his mouth. The gremlins grunted and charged Sam. He laughed and swung out with his mace, expecting to feel bone and flesh pulp beneath his weapon, but it barely killed the first gremlin. These things were far higher level than he had expected. Behind him, the bright eyes of the madman seemed to stare into Sam's soul as he chanted some inane verse. Seventeen slippery seals swam softly, sharply, slowly, singing. Sixteen sharks snapped seventeen seals swimming softly, sharply, slowly, singing. Sam cut out the noise and focused on the battle. As he beat back the advances of the gremlins, he turned towards the man. Who the hell are you? Sam asked, as he blocked a claw slash. Who am I? Who am I? What am I? I am Judge, Judge, Judge. King of the Gremlins. Sam was confused for a moment but then saw who it was. On the power leaderboard, there was a man named Elminster Judge. That, combined with the strength of the gremlins that attended him, told Sam that this was the very same man.